Well, welcome back to our study in Nahum. Uh, we are ending that study today as we look at the third and final chapter. We have seen in our outline in the first chapter of power and pronouncement, the power of God, the pronouncement of judgment. Um, it, in chapter two, we saw the prophecy of the siege and the surrender of the city. And then this is sort of a, a recap um, of looking at the destruction and the desolation of what is left, that uh, it's all gone. So this is, this is really a tragic uh, book to read. It's sad because Nineveh was such a great city. And I'll have comment on that in just a few minutes. Um, and so how quickly that she fell. When uh, Nahum wrote this and wrote this prophecy from the Lord to this city, it was fulfilled within 12 to 13 years it happened. And uh, she fell. Little did they know, 10 years before uh, it would go, they would not even, they didn't even up into the day of it think it was possible for them ever to be defeated. So let's get into the scripture. And once again, uh, things that are underlined on, on the bottom are Hebrew. Uh, renditions are better, not better, but other translation. Uh, word definition to let some more light into the subject. And you'll see how we do that as we go along. Um, as I said, this is sort of a recap. There's new information, but it's a recap. And so the, uh, uh, Nahum comes back and uh, the Lord lists the sins of Nineveh. And what, what is she guilty of? What has happened? Well, here's a bad one. The first one is murder. Um, here are some of the things that went happen. Woe, and that's what the Lord says. Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery, and the prey departs not. And so within this, not only do we see murder, we see it is a, it, the city is a, is a sea of lies and of robbers. And in doing this, the, the, their prey, um, they just continue to prey on people. And they would kill people uh, to rob things. And that's all built within the in robbery. So God's, God's saying right now, woe upon you. The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots. The word jumping there means skipping as the, the chariots are being driven hard and fast through the streets that they bounce and you can, you can hear them uh, click and clacking and thudding as they come running through the streets. And they run people over. Scripture says the horseman lifts up both a bright sword. It's a flaming long knife or a sword and the glittering spear. And there's a multitude of the slain. They just, they, the city had gone so strong so strong government and and the army behind the government and the government used the army just for play and for pleasure and to turn turn the army loose in the streets and there's a great number of carcasses and there's just no end upon it people would when they'd go running through it that's all that would be there there is sexual perversion and witchcraft in verse 4. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms, which are sexual sins, sins of whores, uh, sexual sins of the well-favored, of the charming harlot, the mistresses of witchcrafts that sell nations through her whoredoms. They combine sexual sins with witchcraft, and that usually goes hand in hand of sexual perversions with witchcraft and the families through here. And so this is this when witchcraft and whoredom takes over sexual sins, takes over society, they are well on their way out. And it's just speaking of, hey, they've come and visited this nation now. And they're part of the culture and part of the life that exists. And then we skip way ahead for the third sin of Nineveh, but we'll be coming back, of course. Verse 19, it says, There is no healing of your bruise. Your wound is grievous. And all that hear the report of you 
shall clap their hands over thee, for upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually? And so it's just, once again, I use it's in the culture. It was just a continual thing. Um, and they're just, they were just general, they were just in general, wicked and evil people upon the land, in their politics, in their businesses, and, and how they, 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 they dealt with people. And so somebody, a passerby approaching the city from the outskirts would see in a magnificent walled city, they would see the ships up and down the Tigris and the commerce. They, they would the looking at the farmlands and they would see the crops in but when they got into the city they would see the wickedness when you stripped away the front gate and got a peek and walked the streets it would be known and you would see Nineveh for what she was before her fall there's a going to be a payment and was a payment and ne and Nahum is and preaches the payment of the sins of Nineveh in verses 5 through 7. We already saw that because of the blood they shed, the Lord says that's going to be required of you. And then verses 5 through 7, they, they shamed righteousness. They shamed moral society. They shamed the God of Israel who once was their God. And God says, okay, you shamed me and and." things of God and things that makes a society strong and honesty, you've done that, then I shame you. Behold, I'm against thee, says the Lord of hosts. And the word hosts is the Lord of the army of angels. And I will uncover your skirts upon your face, and I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. So again, this is symbolic, but God is saying, hey, I'll take away the facade and the world will see what you really are. And I will cast, I'll hurl abominable, de detestable, idle filth upon you, is what's talking about you, and make you senseless or foolish. And I'll set thee as a, as a gazing stock, a spectacle that someone would come to see and say, is it really that bad? I can't believe what's happening. Is it really that bad? Let's go see. And it is that bad. And it shall come to pass that all they that look upon you shall flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will be no moan her? Uh, the word waste is Nineveh is devastated. After God puts his hand upon that, the hand of judgment upon that city. And who will bemoan her, or shake her, quiver? Whence shall I seek comforters for thee? The word comforters to call oneself. And what he's What's saying is people will look at this and they'll come and see the waste and they'll say, what can I do? It's gone. What can I do? Our city, the, the city, Nineveh, is laid waste. There's nothing I can do. And then the scripture goes back in some time a little bit and talks about um, other areas that have been destroyed other nations and that that's a picture of what's going to happen to Nineveh. And so the question gets asked in comparison, are you better than populous no that was situate or built or dwell among the rivers that had the waters round about it, whose rampart was the sea and her wall was from the sea? They're talking about no Amon and it is talking about Thebes. No is another word for Thebes in Egypt. Amon was their idol, and their idol god, I should say. And in 663 BC, it was captured by Ashurbanipal of the Assyrian Empire. The word populace is the master architect. And so it is saying, the, the, the verse is reading this, Are you better than the architect that, of of Thebes that built the fortress there, and you build it with your back, uh, one, the Nile River is your defense, and the Mediterranean Sea is your defense, and you had a mighty empire there. Here's a little bit, some of the pictures of some of the ruins of Thebes. Look how large that is as the people walk up. Look at the greatness and the grandeur that existed 
people would come here and say, oh, this is it's incredible. It still is as we look at whatever's left that they've dug up. Throwing also into this also is Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength. And it was infinite. Put and Lubim were your helpers. And I have a modern day map, but I think you could really pick up on this and understand this. There was an alliance back then of along the northern Mediterranean Sea, not, not the entire country of Libya now, but it mentions Libya. And that was her name. And it was on, it would go deep, that the society would come from the north building on, on, that, on that south portion of the Mediterranean Sea of their country, as did Egypt. And then it mentions Egypt all along that, the, all along the Nile River, between that and the Red Sea, fill in that empire. And that's what the Lord was talking about, using the rivers and the seas as fortresses as you built your things. And it says, all these would come to the rescue of the other. There was like that, that, that angular arch of an alliance and a society of these nations and civilizations. And Asher Bernapal comes and he just takes it all. And then all of a sudden it's gone and says, compare that. Yet she was carried away, talking about Thebes, she went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed in pieces at the top of all the streets, and they cast lots for her honorable men, her honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. Exactly what they did to any nation that they beat. Tragic. You also shall be drunken. You shall be hid. You also shall seek strength because of the enemy. And when the flood came to Nineveh 12 years, 13 years after this prophecy. The people were drinking, worshiping their idols, and thinking all was great, we're strong. And now the book ends with, and the prophecy ends with certain destruction of all their stability, whatever they are banking on, whatever they think they have. All your strongholds shall be like fig trees with the first ripe figs. If they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. The strongholds are fortifications. I have a picture artist's renditions of the fall of Nineveh, but I have blue arrowed some of the pictures um, that I'm gonna use almost to the very end. And this is one of the fortifications, it's a rampart. You can see them all along here and they had a second tier of them. Well, when the river flooded, it it would decay and it would it would knock these out and knock this portion out and all of a sudden the, the defense and the walls have been breached and you can see the fighting that goes on and how important these are but if you take these out Nineveh had 1200 of these around the city here's the modern excavation just out around the old city and this was her this was her walls keep in mind they were 50 feet tall so they really go down deep but i have put an arrow on one of their strongholds or their ramparts you can see them all along the road here along the wall behold your people in the midst of thee are women the gates of your land shall be set wide open unto your enemies and the fire shall devour thy bars so it's talking about once again the gates the ramparts will fall, the gates of the city will be flooded and just flood right open. Your enemies will come in and start burning and they'll de devour all your strongholds, such as the burning of Nineveh. Draw thee waters for the siege, fortify your strongholds, go into clay and tread the mortar, make strong the brick kiln. He's saying, you think you can make bricks faster than they fall, go try it, it will, but it won't work. There shall the fire devour you, the sword shall cut you off, it shall eat you up like the canker worm. Make yourself many as the canker worm, make yourself many as the locust. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven, the canker worm spoils and flies away. So he's talking about you built an economy that was second to nobody, that was an incredible. And yet the, the, the army that comes into you is going to eat you 
like a canker worm and take your spoil and they'll they'll run away with it. They'll take they'll route the city, burn it, take what they want home. The crowned are as the locusts and your captain is the great grasshoppers which camp in the hedges in the cold day, but when the sun rises, they flee away and their place is not known where they are. It's talking about Nineveh and all the, the chaos and the disruption, and no one knowing how to get a handle on anything, that those, those people in the upper echelons of government and of the military, they'll, fly, they'll flee like locusts, they'll, they'll run, they'll try to get away and some do escape because they won't know where they've gone to. So instead of fighting and commanding, they flee. Your shepherds are asleep, O king of Assyria. Your nobles shall dwell in the dust. Your people, thy people is scattered upon the mountains and no man gathers them. Your people that lived, they are scattered and nobody's ever going to be able to bring them back together again. Nineveh has never risen again. Never risen again. There is no healing of your bruise. Your wound is grievous. All, and I read this to you already. All that hear the report of you, they clap their hands over thee. From, for upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually? And so that's the recap. And I wrote down three things. It's, there's truth from, from Nineveh and the fall of it. And if you've been with me this whole time, you, we started way back in the book of Jonah, that God called Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach and say, you need to repent. You got 40 days to repent or God's going to destroy the city. They repented. And from that time to the fall, from Jonah's time to the fall, it was about 125 to 30 years. That's all it was. So the first point that I bring up to you is God blesses repentance and those that live in righteousness thereafter. But God blesses repentance. God sees the heart. God sees the contrite heart. God sees the one that's asking forgiveness. And God always will reward that. God will forgive. And all of a sudden, we're part of God's family and we're God at God's program. See, Nineveh got with God's program. They got rid of all their idols. They got rid of the, the, the sexual sins. They got rid of the, the witchcraft out under, under Jonah. There was a revival in that land and those people turned to the Lord and they became righteous people. All right, here's, you say, well, why 120 some years later? It's that, that it fell because truth must be passed on from generation to generation. And if it's not, then there are gaps and no one knows from where you came and where you're going to ultimately end up again. And so the, the adults that repented, they had children and they saw that and probably some children repented to the Lord. But the children could see that and they had firsthand information. And so when the next generation is born and starting to grow, that generation lived and was witness of that. And they could, they could relate late and they needed to relate that to their children. And the kids, those kids caught a lot of it, but they didn't catch it all necessarily because we're into the third generation now and the fourth is all that all that that took and they they were by the fourth generation they were all back to where they'd started and understand the third thing here sin will ultimately be paid for god is so merciful the civilizations can can often get away with a lot for a while we'd say that's a long time but in god's eyes it's not long but God always will deal with sin, and sin ultimately will be paid. The Bible says, be sure your sin will pay you out, uh, will find you out, I'm sorry. And that applies not just to nations, but that also applies to people, to you and to me. Ultimately, what we, the wrong we are doing will catch us. If man doesn't get us, God's got our number. We need to be... We need to be people of the Lord, people of the word, people, 
people that are walk in humble and humility before the Lord and seek to live righteously, doing right things in our culture and in our society in front of other people. And so before we go, let's, I've used a lot of pictures, but I've mainly used these. Here's the one I used when Jonah arrived at Nineveh and the artist concept and the, and the Tigris River flowing through the, through the city. Took Jonah, the Bible says, three days to walk from one end to the other. It was nine square miles, three miles one way on the walls, mile and a half the other, three on the backside and a mile and a half coming forward. I wonder it took him three days. A great city, one time. Beautiful city, archaeological things are starting to find bear this out. The Assyrian Empire was an incredible empire. Yet her destruction, the Bible says, was very swift. There's the river, breaching, flooding, growing taller and higher. The Babylonian army, with the help of the Medes and some other tribal nations, in they came, breached their ramparts, burned their city. So how do I say, may the Lord bless this book to your life and to my life. Go back and just think through it and, and apply, it, apply it to today. And we learn from it. We can learn from the mistakes of other nations so that we don't repeat them. We can learn the mistakes of other people and other nations so that as an individual, we don't repeat them. We can see the hand of God and the goodness of God. Thank you for sticking through this. This was, this was a tough book. And if you listen to this one, two, and three chapters all through the book, may the Lord bless you for it. And I, I appreciate your, your tenacity to stay through what can be some really hard reading and hard listening. Father, thank you for this book. There are things we can learn as a nation and we can learn as a people. Teach them and drive them into our heart, those truths, and may we walk with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.